All right, everyone. We are winding down the event for today, but not before our closing keynote. And I promise you, you do not want to miss this one. Our next keynote is Dr. Janelle McCauley, a combat veteran, leader, human performance specialist. And I got to say, I'm personally excited about this keynote because I'm a huge fan of mindfulness. And Dr. McCauley has implemented a mindful practice for the U.S. military. You are in for a treat and a great discussion, and we'll see you right after to wrap things up. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our concluding keynote, and I'm very pleased to have Dr. Janelle McCauley here with us today. Janelle, great to have you here. Thank you, John. I'm really excited to be here with you and your team. Great. So uh, Dr. McCauley is a specialist in mindfulness, uh, mindfulness education and training and helping people perform in high stress environments. And this is an experience she really is an expert in because she was a, a pilot in the U.S. Air Force. She flew C-130s, KC-10s, and there's one more. What am I leaving out? C-21, Learjet. C-21, right. Um, and she, um, she brought the practice of mindfulness into her leadership when she was in the military. And she's taken the lessons she's learned and brought them into the corporate sector and advises the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice on how to use mindfulness to maximize effectiveness and, and help teams perform as best they possibly can. So obviously, these topics are very germane to all of us in the cybersecurity industry and the cybersecurity community but in particular for the leadership lessons that we focus on here at Purple Hat. So it's it's great to have you and, and thank you for joining us. Absolutely. I look forward to uh, where the conversation goes today. Great. Well, let's, I think, I mean, I, there are so many questions to pose to you. I think one of the first things is what, what brought you to public service in the first place? And uh, how, how, how did that initial interest in public service, how does that continue to inspire you in your work? So I grew up in a family of public servants. Both my grandfathers served in World War II in the Marine Corps. And then my uncle was a Marine helicopter pilot. He flew MH-53s in the Marines. He actually was also uh, the pilot for President Reagan and Marine One um, back in the 80s. And so as a kid, I was always around aviation. He would take me to the air shows. He would talk about airplanes a lot. The military was kind of in my blood. I had a calling for some sort of public service and community uh, career uh, from an early age. Um, couple that with my dad, who was a police officer. And if you can imagine, when I, even I was seven years old, I distinctly remember my dad would tell anyone that would listen that I was going to grow up to be a submarine warfare commander or a combat pilot. And back in the 80s, those jobs weren't even available to women. And his goal was just to inspire me to do or be anything that I could dream of for myself. And so with those two influences in my life, plus just this family of, you know, uh, service where it was a center of our family kind of core competencies and values, um, it was natural for me to head toward a military career. Now, I did choose the Air Force rather yeah, I was than the ask Marine. about that. Yeah. So um, I did make that shift. I almost did go to the Naval Academy, but in the end, I decided to go for the Air Force Academy instead. Um, at the time, this was, you know, like early 90s, they were there were more pilot slots in the Air Force. And um, so I just kind of was like hedging my bets there. But um, it was the best decision I made. And, you know, service is one of my core values. And it has been just a, a wonderful journey since I started on it. Yeah, it sounds like it. So tell us about how did you first learn about mindfulness as a practice? So it started as a journey of self necessity for me. I had always been a high performer. So you can imagine growing up as I did, you know, with this drive to, you know, be something, do something with my life different, especially as my dad would say, um, mm -hmm. even if, you know, it wasn't available to me, how could I make it happen? 
And so I was in pursuit of that. And I was very successful um, through my time at the Air Force Academy, my early career, um, knocking down all the milestones I needed for a successful career of service and the Air Force, as well as being a pilot. But what I found is that I hit a really big brick wall about midway through my career. And it really became, um, you know, I, I became unable or unable to really focus on thriving in the environments I was in. I was so worried about everything going on. I was listening to the narratives inside my head. I was becoming a mother. I was a military spouse. My husband also served. And there was a lot of overwhelming pressure on me. And I was still gutting it out most days. And so for all intents and purposes, anyone that would have looked at me in my career and thought, gosh, she has it all, whatever that means. Um, but deep down, I was not happy. I wasn't joyful. And I literally found myself in a space where I was, I forgot how to laugh and I lost sight of the love that was right in front of me. I was so busy trying to be perfect at every little thing. I kind of forgot that there's growth and learning with our imperfections. And I know there might be some recovering perfectionists out there listening to this. And this burnout really hit me hard. And I had the opportunity at that time to go back to school to get my PhD for the Air Force. And I really wanted to study how we as human beings can thrive through high pressure situations to be high performers, but also find joy in our lives. And when I went and dove into the research, it was really to help me, you know, survive the next 10 years of my military career. But what I found is that it wasn't unique to my experience, the people I led. My peers were all suffering from these same things. So if I could find a solution, maybe it could help more people. And that's actually exactly what I did. I, I sought out the research and really discovered that in the path of performance and in pursuit of being our best, we as human beings can train and prepare in three ways. We can train our body, we can train our craft, and we can train our mind. And up until that point, I knew how to train my body and my craft. I was really good at that. But no one had really exposed me to this deliberate and intentional training of my mind. So once I learned that, right, it kind of was this aha moment for my own experience. And then it really uh, created an opportunity for me to share it with others. That's amazing um, and super, super cool. So how did you bring what you learned into the institution of your, well, first in, in your squadron, um, and then more broadly into the, into the Department of Defense. Yes. On that pathway, I was re researching. I tried everything that I was looking into, right? If I was studying something like acupuncture, I was trying it on myself. If I was studying, you know, because really I, my, my thesis or my dissertation was about how do you build the most effective human weapon system to execute mm -hmm. high stress missions? And so I studied every aspect of human performance. And really what I found was this idea of training the mind was most effective for me. And at the core of that was the idea of doing mental push-ups in the form of a mindfulness practice to really get my mind more on a play button instead of living on the iPod of storytelling in fast forward and rewind. And um, it was it was so powerful in my life. I just started with my own example. And when I took command of my squadron, I just wanted to create opportunities for others to learn about these skill sets. But I found that their curiosity just compelled me to share more and more. They kept asking, you know, most of us are overwhelmed and stressed right now. How are you holding it all together? And what I could teach them was that stress is actually a perceived emotion. It's actually our brain's calculation as to whether the demands of the moment, if we have the internal resources to meet those demands. And most of the time, right, our brain feels overwhelmed by the things that are coming at us. And so we're actually making a choice to see stress as overwhelming. And so part of it is learning how to rewire your brain to see your stress right, in a new and different way, like as a uh, benefit to the things you want to do, as a performance enhancer, um, and as a way to use cer certain skill sets to change the way we see uh, the lens with which we look at the experiences as we, you know, as they kind of unfold for us. And That's so that, that was something I just started ta talking to people about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, so for a lot of us who maybe have tried meditation or mindfulness practice or are interested in it, can you talk a little bit about some of the obstacles you encountered as you began to grow into it and a little bit about 
the trajectory of change that you experienced as you began this process? I think that would be really instructive for folks that are tuning in because, you know, everyone after the pandemic and the stresses of the world that we live in, um, I think this would be really helpful for people. Absolutely. When I started this mission of educating, changing my life and then educating and, and um, helping others do the same, this was 2010 timeframe. And we really weren't as open talking about proactive mental health strategies or things like mental pushups and meditation, especially in the environment of the military. You know, you name the high stress occupation, it just wasn't something that was at the forefront of our training and preparation practices. And so I was fa facing a lot of um, bureaucratic inertia uh, in, the, in the government sector and the military sector that was really anti-change. Right? I was asking people to slow down, to speed up their professional success. And that actually goes against almost everything that I had been taught earlier in my career because it was mostly about the hustle, right? Like the more you hustle, the more you work hard, the more rewards and, and success you will see in your life. Well, actually, when you study high performers, that's actually not the pathway. That is the pathway to burnout. It's going to happen at different levels for different people. But the real path to performance is integrating recovery practices, is training your mind, is slowing down to speed up. In fact, in the special operations community of the Air Force, we have a motto, and that slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And we can talk about it all day and how we execute our mission. And I was acting, asking people to think about it and how we actually set ourselves up as human beings for the mission sets that we're asked to do. And that was a very different way of looking at the problem set. So I did face many challenges. I faced a lot of skepticism in my methods, but I was definitely committed to continuing to demonstrate the power in these skill sets, continuing to share the skill sets. And now we've seen a, a real change and a real turn of the tide because we're realizing this is a powerful um, performance enhancer for the things we want to do. Yeah. I mean, so my assumption would be that Air Force pilots who are operating on the edge with the incredible machinery and who have to be intensely focused, it feels like a natural overlap between mindfulness practice and that kind of high intensity. Can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about like the technical components of being a pilot in relation to mindfulness? So it's interesting that you bring up this connection for pilots with in, intense focus and the things that really are the products of a, pro, a productive mindfulness practice. It's actually rooted in the, the ancient warrior. It's in this tradition of being really disciplined with your mind and being very focused in what you think about and how you pay attention to the important things as they're unfolding. And then how you go do very difficult and hard things and then reintegrate with your tribe. That's actually a big core competency of the ancient warrior. We have just lost our connection with that over the years, right? As it has become a kind of a stigmatized thing, a soft skill, if you will, that most pilots would say, no, I don't, I don't need that, right? Um, and so what we do is we train by doing hard things repetitively over and over again, which is one strategy for building mental strength. I just call it an incomplete strategy. We need to reconnect with our ancient warrior. We need to build that contemplative focus like disciplined mind so that when we're in an airplane flying, you know, hundreds of miles an hour where lives are on the line, where things don't always go right, where we're in unpredictable environments as they unfold, we're able to have clarity of thought to make the best decisions in those intense moments. And really, we know from the research, the only way you get there is by living your life on the play button, keeping your mind not inside the narratives and the storytelling and like what we would say, like if you think of your attention system, like a flashlight, the flashlight turning inward at thoughts, feelings, and emotions. We want that, feel, that flashlight external because that's where performance happens. It happens in the moment. And we need to train our brains to live there more often. Could you offer the audience a series of recommendations for how they can start tomorrow to do to make this practice a reality and to, to gain some of the benefits that you're talking about? The best place to start is with a mindfulness practice and to think of it as 
as mental push-ups. Mm -hmm. And it can be as easy as doing one minute a day. In fact, the technique that I like to teach is the mindful minute because everybody has the space for one minute. If I were to tell you, you have to do 10 minutes all in one sitting, that can be overwhelming for some individuals. You may try it tomorrow or today and you might you know, keep up with it for a couple days, but it can be demanding to fit and squeeze in that 10 minutes. But if I tell you, you can do 10 one minute sessions throughout your day, it's a little bit more achievable, especially when you sit back and think about all the spaces where you sit in boredom and you try to stimulate your brain in a different way, right? We reach for our phones. In fact, most of the time we scroll on our phones for about three to five minutes and then realize we're doing it, right? We There's this other concept, so I'll just divert real quick, but I will get to the skill set. This concept called mind wandering, and what that means is that when, you ha when you're you having an off-task thought during an ongoing task or activity, right? I'm telling myself to read this page in a book, but then I get to the bottom of the page and I think, oh my gosh, I don't even remember what I just read. Because my mind was mentally hijacked, right? It, it loves to time travel. And so while I was reading that page in a book, it got distracted. And the research tells us almost half of our waking moments that happens. So half the time, we're not paying attention to what's going on right in front of us. And so to decrease the amount of that distraction, which by the way, is a time waster. If you think about you're doing a task and it takes you an hour to do the task, it really only takes you 30 minutes of focus 30 minutes of distraction because you're going to be distracted by your email, by your phone, by someone coming into your office. Um, those things will take away your productivity and your efficiency. So the technique of a mindful minute really helps train our attention system, that flashlight from going internal to staying external, to staying focused on the play button of our mind so that we can be higher performing in the moment, more productive. And actually, it also helps us connect with others so that we can actually pay attention when we're having those relationships and we're having the, that communication, which is a huge problem, I think, in today's world. Yeah, um, that's amazing. Can you talk a little bit about that mindful minute and how we like what we should do to train our brains and to maximize the experience of that mindful minute? So it begins with just focusing on something that's in your pre present moment. So our breath is what I like to use because A, it's um, always with us and B, it costs nothing. So we hope, we hope right, it's always with us. Yeah. No, yeah. Sorry. Always, <laughs> always have it. Right. So you could be in a combat zone in an airplane and have a skill set, right? Like with your breath, or you can be dropping your kids off to school in the morning, hitting every red light on the way to school and like getting so frustrated and you can use your breath. Um, in those moments as well. So when we train on our breath, what we're really doing is I, I want you to focus on a particular sensation of the inhale and exhale. So maybe it's the way the air goes in and out of your nostrils. Maybe it's the way that your belly or chest rises or falls through the, for, through the breath and the experience. But you focus intently on that particular sensation for an entire minute. Now, in the span of a minute, your mind will wander. You'll get distracted by something. A thought will pop into your head. So the idea is that you do a mental push-up when that thought appears. So that flashlight of our attention system, right, is focusing on our breath. A thought pops in. It starts chasing the thought. The first part is a awareness that we're actually chasing a thought. Remember the page in a book and you don't even have awareness that you're not paying attention? So the first, the first thing we're training is awareness that we're following thoughts, that there are thoughts inside our heads. Then the second step is letting go of the thought and redirecting our focus back on our breathing. And every time you do that, right, you breathe, you're focusing, you chase the thought, you let it go, you redirect and refocus, you're doing a mental push-up. You're strengthening your muscle of attention from turning internal to, to staying external. And the more you repetitively practice this, the more available the skill set of taking a deep breath and honing in on your focus will be for you when you're in an intense moment. So it's not that I am in my plane in a combat zone with a thunderstorm, lost an engine, right? Like in a, a combat environment where I have to find a place to land. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, I need to practice my mindful minute right now. No, I've done the mindful minute ahead of time. So in the moment, I can just take that single deep breath refocus my attention on what's most important so that I can handle the situation and perform at my best. Can you t go a little bit further with that? So you're in that stressful moment, you're 
all those things that you're confronted with. How does breathing help you focus on what needs to happen? Like what's the next part of your cognitive engagement having done the mindful minute? So there are two things that happen um, when you practice mindfulness and this mindful breathing. Um, when, like we would say ground speed zero, that's what we would call it in the uh, flying world, right? Nothing's happening right now. You can practice on the ground, right? So that when it's in the air, like when it really counts, you've, you've prepped it, right? You visualized it and practiced it. So when we're at ground speed zero, we can practice this breathing. And two things is happening. We are training our attention system and our mind to be more focused and present. So because that is where high performance happens. It happens in the moments that we are um, completely uh, disciplined with our focus and our attention system. And so that's where we're able to access right? All of our knowledge and our, our cognitive capacity to make better decisions that are more rational instead of emotional re, emotionally reactive, right? Because many times when we get ourselves into trouble, it's because we feel anxious, we're in our stress response, and we fall into what's called distress. We tend to like hyperventilate in our chest. Our mind is kind of wandering all over the place and we'll make an emotional decision. And instead, when we practice our breathing, when we get into a high stress situation, the second thing we've done, right? The first thing is that we're, we're working on our mind and our attention system. But the second thing we're doing with practicing breathing is we're reconnecting our mind and body together so that when we take a nice deep breath, our mind knows, oh, we're safe, we're mm -hmm. okay, and we can calm down. And that's actually rooted in a, um, uh, our vagus, uh, vagus nerve and our polyvagal system that is actually part of our ancient brain. So even think back to our ancestors and say there was a threat they faced like a saber tooth tiger. I'm just making that up, but say that was a threat they had. They would run it right. They go into their stress response, fight, fight, or freeze. They'd run away as fast as they can. As soon as they were safe, what would be the first thing they would do? Drink a bunch of beer. <sighs> well, besides that, <laughs> they would take a deep exhale, right? It would be like, run away and then, Right. Like, okay, I'm safe. I can calm down. So that part of our brain still exists. We don't exercise it very often because we're not running from saber tooth tigers. But the, what, what happens is we're on a call with customer service and we get anxious. We're about to take a test and we're anxious. We're, you know, performing, giving a speech and we get anxious. Those are the threats we see today that put us into our stress response. So when we've trained our body to take a nice deep breath, we can calm that mechanism and tell our brain it's safe. We're okay. We can be calm right now. And then topple, like couple that with the training of mindfulness so that our mind and our attention system are right on the play button in the moment, right? Then we can rise to the challenge and be our best. That is an incredible insight. And I think a great place to stop because after the end of this talk, you should go and practice your mindful minute and and look more into uh, into what Dr. McCauley's talked about because obviously we we need these kinds of practices not just in 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 the military but in all of, all aspects of our lives right it's incredibly important your message uh, is a great one and thank you for all the work you've done for pioneering this kind of um, thinking within the military and then and then bringing it to us it's great to have you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this message. And, you know, having worked with a lot of cybersecurity professionals um, in my career as well, it's an important job and it can be, you know, a split second decisions, lots of pressure. And so hopefully some of these skill sets, especially starting with that mindful minute can help you kind of what I like to say is get command of your mind instead of allowing your mind to command you, especially when you're in a challenging situation. That's great. Terrific insights. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and immensely valuable. So go forth and practice your mindful minute. Everyone get out there and do it. I look forward to hearing about everyone's mindful minutes. Thank you so much. Bet. All right, cybersecurity enthusiasts, you have made it all the way through the end of our third annual Purple Hats Conference. We hope you gathered a ton of information that you can put into play right away in your own cybersecurity practice. And once again, keep your eyes peeled for the full suite of on-demand videos that you can catch on the replay just in case you miss anything. Also, be sure to be on the lookout for a post-event survey. This is extremely helpful for all of us to hear and the Attack IQ team to hear 
for what you liked and what you would like to see more of so we can make each event more special. It has been a complete honor guiding you through today's conference. Until we meet again, stay safe, crush it, and keep thinking purple. See you on the replay. See you next year.